Welcome to another insightful episode of Parent Entrepreneur Power. In this podcast, Mary Catherine Johnson and Evan Johnson highlight the successes and struggles of parents in business. They share how to be the example of success in entrepreneurship to foster the same in your child, and so much more. Are you ready to power up? Okay, welcome everybody to another very exciting episode of Parent Entrepreneur Power. I've got my lovely co-host, Mary Catherine Johnson, also known as my mom, here with me as always. And uh, we have a really incredible guest today, John. Uh, John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, you guys. I'm excited to be here. So we'd like to start off in the same place with all our guests. And that is by making sure that the audience is on the same page. So go ahead and tell us, who are you? And what do you do? Sure. So my name is John Corcoran. Um, I am the father of four. We're recording this at a super relevant time because a busy entrepreneur. And it just so happens that I'm watching my kids. My wife is away for a couple of days. Her first break since the pandemic started in about a year and a half. Um, so I'm super excited for her. And I've got a head cold. So it's like perfect timing <laughs> to, uh, you know, do double duty and uh, no time like the present to do this. But um, what I do is uh, I'm a recovering attorney, started my career in politics, worked at, I was privileged to work in the, the Clinton White House. Um, but now uh, about um, uh, 12 years ago now, started a podcast called Smart Business Revolution, continue to do it to this day. Uh, all for the first six or seven years, just told everyone you should start a podcast like you guys. The, you know, it's an amazing gift to, to talk to people all the time, meet new people. Um, and no one would do it. Everyone would, would come up with an excuse. So about four or five years ago, we started helping other people and it became our primary thing. And so we focus on B2B businesses, helping them to get started, to launch and to manage an ongoing uh, uh, profitable podcast for B2B businesses. That is fantastic. Oh my goodness. I mean, I know about your podcast. I knew that you uh, uh, had that and were very successful with it, but I know you from the uh, uh, the sign in your background, the Rise 25. I mean, you do yeah. other event kind of things as well. And I've just got to comment on your, your comment about your wife going, that's just a day in the life of the entrepreneur, right? You just got to yep. take what <laughs> gets thrown yeah. at you. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. But tell us right. about Rise 25. Yeah. So uh, Rise 25. So we... Um, started the company and we initially, as you said, we're, we're more of an event business. So we started with one small event. My business partner and I had both been doing podcasts for about five or six years. And then we were both going to a conference and he called me up and said, Hey, do you want to do a small group mastermind before this conference? And I said, sure. So we did it. We had a lot of fun. And then we kept on going from there and did a lot more events together, um, including one you came to Mary Catherine. It was a blast having you there. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Fortunately, though, um, before the pandemic hit, we kind of knew I, I, I had had, you know, three kids and then four kids. And I was saying to Jeremy, my business partner, that like, hey, I can't be traveling all the time, can't be on the road, can't be in a situation where the only way you're making money is if you're getting on an airplane and going somewhere. And so I knew we had to switch it up and we had to create something that was not as dependent on travel and events. I love doing events, but I didn't want to be totally dependent on it. So even going into 2020, we had changed things and we were focused more on the side of our business, helping other B2B businesses to start podcasts for content marketing and business development purposes. And um, so even going into 2020, we would have made that, we would have made the event part of our business would have been a much smaller part of our business. Of course, it became tiny because of uh, you know COVID and everything. Um, but, uh, we had started in events and then eventually pivoted and focused on what we're doing now. Got it. That's why I wasn't as familiar with it because I knew you in that. I remember when yeah. we were at that, uh, event, I don't remember the name of it, but, um, Rakuten, right. That's it. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. I think it was in the city. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think you, your little one was either just born or really little, your late, your fourth child, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, let's see. Was that, that might've been, yes, I think you're right. Probably 20, yeah, she was born. She was born five weeks early in November of 2018. Um, actually, here's an entrepreneurial story for you. I mean, this was crazy. So I had three kids. I had about an eight-year-old, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And on my birthday, I went camping with the two oldest ones. 
and we were out in the middle of nowhere in Marin County. And what you never want to happen is a police officer to show up outside of your tent in the middle of nowhere. And that's what happened. A sheriff showed up in the middle of nowhere, says through the tent as I'm dead asleep, Mr. Corcoran, please step out of the tent. I need to speak to you. And I step out of the tent and he was like, what happened? And, uh, and he says, your wife's okay, but she's in the hospital. She was 30 weeks pregnant at this point. She's in the hospital. Uh, you need to leave now. You need to come. And uh, so we had to wrap everything up middle of the night, you know, and then drive down this windy little road. And I have no idea what's going on. And um, what turns out, it ended up being OK. But what ended up happening was um, she'd had some complications, some bleeding. Fortunately, didn't lose the baby. Baby was fine. But she ended up having to go in the hospital for five weeks and basically be on bed rest in the hospital. Uh, I like to joke that she was watching Netflix while I was like running, watching after three kids, which is crazy. But on top of that, life of the entrepreneur, right? So in addition to that happening, wife going in the hospital, a week later, my four-year-old breaks his arm. Um, a week after that, they all get lice all through the house. So we've got these pictures now in my wife's hospital room where she's confined. She's not allowed to leave the hospital. She's like stuck there for five weeks until she give birth. And, and we have like a, there was like a guy we paid who came out who was like combing their hair for lice, you know, and there was a couple of other things that happened in there, but it was just like, you know, kind of total chaos during that period of time. I look back at it fondly now and think I'm glad that's not happening. When it rains, it pours, right? When it rains, it pours. That's for sure. <laughs> well, that's with Evan there. I was in the same situation, uh, definitely not bleeding, but definitely in early labor. And I was hospitalized for about a week to stop the labor and, uh, and tell him my first parental decision. No, you're not ready to come out yet. Uh, <laughs> <Glad> <laughs> and now listened. I've got an amazing 23 year old. So yeah, uh, that's yeah, great. It, it works out. Uh, so how old are your kids now? So now we have 11, eight, five, and three, three boys. And then a girl, beautiful little girl. And do they know what dad does? Are they, do they have any concept? A little bit. Yeah, I do. I try and weave it in. I try and talk to them about things. Um, You know, I try and teach them little lessons here and there. Like one thing I've gotten the habit of recently, I just try and work on different mindset things, try and get them to appreciate gratitude. Mindset is so incredibly important as a, as an entrepreneur. So one thing we always do, which I got from my neighbor is, at the end of each day, when they come home from school, I'll say, what were your highs and lows? What was a high and what was a low? But recently, I, I, I added some more things. So I started asking them also, what are you grateful for today from today? And I, and I say, it can be something really, really small. It doesn't need to be big. You know, I want to know what it was. And I get them to say something. Because um, it's funny, because like some of your kids are more positive, some more negative. Like one of my kids, my, my son, Toby, who's eight, like he'll be like, my high was this and I didn't have a low. He'll say that a lot of times, you know? And um, so, but other kids sometimes will focus on, they'll dwell on the negative. So you want to have them pick something that they're, they're grateful for. And then the other thing, and I got this from Sarah Blakely, founder of Spanx, who recently sold Spanx. Um, she gets her kids to try something and to fail at it and to acknowledge that failure because a lot of times failure is not celebrated in our society. We need to celebrate failure because you're going to fail a lot. You're going to try things and you're going to fail. So I'll ask my kids, what did you try today and fail, fail at? And a lot of times I will tell them something that daddy tried and failed at. You know, today I tried to do this and it didn't work out, but it's okay. And then, and they'll tell me something that they tried and failed at and I'll give them a high five, say high five, give them a high five, you know? And so I just kind of weave, try to weave those things in there. Um, In addition to like doing things like, my, some of my kids have gotten into Monopoly from time to time, so we'll do Monopoly. It's really interesting what, how that's like kind of a, a great lesson. Um, I also, uh, I also um, there's, a, there's a game called Cash Flow from Robert Kiyosaki, which I haven't bought yet. But I asked a bunch of entrepreneurs like what games they play to teach their kids entrepreneurship and money management. And it's a couple of you recommended that. It's like $100 for sale on, on eBay. I guess it's out of print or something. Yeah. So my kids wreck everything that it comes in our house. So I'm going to wait a couple more years before throwing that one in. And then actually, um, Mike McCallowitz, who's an author who's been on um, my podcast a, a couple of times, a kind of, for a couple of different, he wrote The Pumpkin Plan, uh, Profit First, a couple of other different books. He's got a new children's book out. Um, 
I forget what it's called. I just, it's about money and, and aimed at kids and stuff like that. I just bought it and give it to the kids for the holidays. So um, I'll try and, you know, do stuff like that in order to educate kids, not so much like explaining to them exactly what I do on a day to day basis. Cause some of them are a little too young to understand that. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, especially the 11 year old. I mean, do you, um, do you see any, particular skills coming funny, out and funny you, know. you mentioned that so yeah he, of, of all the kids i mean he's the oldest but he's the one who i i see kind of some entrepreneurial potential in him um he has adhd um, pretty significant adhd um not lack of uh, attention but like um hyperactivity more on that end of the scale um and there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have adhd out there so that's going to require like adaptation, being able to adapt. Uh, but it also teaches you to, to delegate and to take things off your plate and focus on things you're good at. Um, but I actually had him take a, a, a class during the pandemic on entrepreneurship, um, which was, it was online. Um, he would come to my office on Friday afternoons and he'd sit here and he'd do it via Zoom. And they had them kind of come up with like a business idea and they played a game the whole time. And it was interesting because like, they had to come up with a business idea. His first business idea was something a little bit kind of boring. It was like, and, and lack, not really specific. He likes kind of adventures, like adventure traveling kind of stuff. So it had something to do with like outdoorsy type of stuff. And, and that like, it wasn't unique. It, it didn't really have clear product market fit. And then he's pivoted from that to this idea that was like from Japan. It's like these little water bubble things that allow you to transport water, a lot l less waste, less plastic waste. And it was like biodegradable and it hasn't been introduced in the United States. And it was funny because I was telling my business partner about it, who started multiple different companies. And after the first one, he was like, eh, he was okay. Like trying to be supportive and stuff. And then, and then Mason tells him the second one, he's like, well, that's, that's actually really, that's a really interesting idea. That's, that's actually pretty good. So it's kind of cool to see him like, see the difference between those two ideas. And that's only the first two, right? I mean, as it's we only know, the first two, right. Exactly. Entrepreneurs, how yeah, many? Exactly. <laughs> no. I mean, the point of the class was more to just go through the exercise, follow through with it. Um, you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, I feel like it's important to kind of build up your ability to come up with ideas, which is kind of a skill in and of itself, but it's Absolutely. less about, I mean, it's not like, you know, he's probably not expected to, uh, come up with a winning business idea right out of the gate at 11 after taking, you know, one class. It's more about the fact that he's coming up with any ideas at all. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, it's just kind of like exercising that skill set in particular, yeah. you know? Yeah. Training yeah. our brains, right. That's really um, when you talked about mindset, I mean, that's really what it's all about. It's, and, and we all have to start wherever we are. So you're obviously helping them cultivate that, thought process of no matter how my day went, I can find positives, I can find negatives, and I can find things that I'm either good at, or also that maybe didn't work so well. And right. the ones that don't work so well, give me even more fertile, fertile ground to be able to find the ones who that do. And so to allow for your kids to develop that kind of mindset to critically think about themselves and their day and their experiences is the best starting ground for entrepreneurship or even, even working for anyone else. It doesn't have to be working for yourself. It's just, these are just maturity things, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, another thing I'll do with them. And by the way, the name of, I found that Mike Michalowicz's new book is my money bunnies fund money management for kids. Um, oh, there's another book also that I introduced my kids to um, V band, the founder Contactually did a book um, and it's called, um, uh, I think it's called try Dory, try, try Dora, try, or try, try, no, no, try, try again. Dahlia, I think is the name of it. And it's about a little girl who comes up with an idea. First, she wants to sell water on a stand and no one wants to buy it. And then she like kind of iterates and it gets a little bit better, a little better. And then she lands on lemonade and then realizes people want to buy lemonade. And then she hires her friends to help staff the lemonade stand. And it's a cute little book. I loved it, you know? And I read that one to my kids, but, um, uh, you know, to, the other thing I was going to say is with my kids is it's just like, I'll try and weave in to them, like little lessons here and there. Like we had, um, you know, like 
Thanksgiving recently and I took most of the week off because my kids are off school and it creates chaos and it's hard for my wife to take care of them. And so like, you know, just like tell them like, you know, well, daddy works for himself. So I have a little bit of flexibility to be able to take that time off. It's a good thing. I don't work, you know, you know, for someone else. And, and then I wouldn't have that much flexibility. Now, the truth is you got to work really hard a lot of times. Right. Um, and I'll reinforce that to them, but you know, I'll, I'll tell them that those are some of the perks or like other times, like we're driving over the freeway on a Friday night and at five o'clock and we see just a ton of traffic coming back from the city and all these people stuck in traffic. And I'll say like, Oh my God, that looks miserable. I'm so glad I'm not stuck in that traffic. Good thing. Daddy works for himself and he decided to put his office four minutes away from our house so that there's greater flexibility well you know daddy works really hard in order to make that possible you know it wasn't easy um but i did that for you guys so that there's greater flexibility so i'm close to you guys and here i am instead of being stuck in traffic for an hour driving home we're driving back from you know the grocery store or whatever whatever we did at that time wow so what can you imagine, let's say you're 11 year old in the, the class that he took, um, can you imagine some skill that he has or that that may be unlocked for him? And maybe by the time he's maybe 15, 16, being able to maybe not necessarily work for you, but learn a skill, especially with podcast production. Um, mm-hmm. I, can, I can tell you right now, Evan, that's exactly how he got into entrepreneurship. Uh, because at the age of 16, he was looking for something to do. And actually I didn't want to do my own podcast production anymore. And, uh, I said, Hey, do you want to learn how to do this and earn some money? Awesome. And yeah. Great. That, Look for those opportunities, wherever they come from. Right? That's you it. Know? Yeah. yeah. And it, and it now spawned <clears throat> a, a successful podcast production business for him once oh, he awesome. yeah. decided yeah. to actually do, do something, you know, all of his, all of his friends were getting jobs. Right. And he's like, what mm-hmm. am I going to do? Um, and he yeah. tried, tried working, right, Evan, you tried working at a job, but now yeah, I, wor- I worked at a Starbucks for like a month before <laughs> I quit when I realized how just, Oh God. Compared to being an entrepreneur, like it really sucks. So yeah, yeah no. The yeah, perks yeah. far outweigh the negative negatives of of being an entrepreneur, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, I, I I do try and teach the kids to look for those types of opportunities, look for the pain points, you know, how could you help someone else? Um, but then like the next level thing is to think like not just how could I do that, but how could I bring in that opportunity and then bring someone else in to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because, um, uh, my kids have been doing swim lessons with this, uh, an entrepreneur here in town who wanted to teach his 16 year old son to do swim lessons like he did when he was younger so that that son wouldn't have to like work a job doing 10 bucks an hour, but could actually do a half an hour swim lesson, make 30 bucks a kid a lot better. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so like he has been kind of mentoring my son a little bit and saying, hey, one day maybe you can work for Robert. That's his son, um, you know, and, and so he kind of starts to see that pr- progression, see how those kind of opportunities can come along. Um, but I mean, honestly, I'm not, I'm not going to push him to go into what I've done um, as much as I'm passionate about podcasting. I, I equally like will try and, you know, and they're still a little young, but the 11 year old, I'll kind of talk to him a little bit about you know, like look for like opportunities. What's the next phase of growth? What's the next opportunity? Like what's the internet in the nineties? You know, is it blockchain? Is it Bitcoin? Is it AI? Is it, what is it, you know? And so my, my son listens to the wow, wow in the world podcast, which is from NPR, which is an awesome podcast for kids, especially if they're interested in science. So he'll listen to that and he'll learn a lot about the world. He'll learn about different changes that are happening. And then we also subscribe to a book called, the, uh, sorry, a magazine called the week junior based on the week, which is for grownups, but it's a kid's version. And that's got all kinds of like, you know, things that are happening in the world that, that he learns about. And, um, you know, cause I want him to like, I want him to hop onto the next trend, you know, that's coming along. Like podcast has been a great trend over the last 20 years. Um, and there's huge power to jumping on a trend as it's on an, on its upward trajectory. Yeah. That's huge. You know, part of the reason I got out of practicing law is law is really on a downward trajectory. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I joke to people all the time, but it's not that, you know, it's not gonna be that far in the future where we're going to be like, 
hey Siri, form me an LLC, yeah. or hey, or hey Siri, like uh, draft me an NDA. Yeah. You know that kind of thing is is not that far removed. Um, and when I graduated from law school, tw- just twelve years ago, um, you know people would go into document review. Lawyers would go into document review, which was meant you're stuck in a room with boxes and boxes of material. And they would read over these documents, mainly read over these documents, looking for certain keywords together. Well, now it's like, you know, you scan it and you look do character recognition and AIs are, are finding the information that you need much more efficiently. And, and um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of changes that are happening in that industry. You want to get into an industry, you go on into opportunities where there's growth and a growth, re- uh, growth trajectory. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, because that's a really interesting concept. I agree 100%. I'm, I just came back from a conference on NFTs and uh, yeah. in Miami, and um, I'm really excited about because my gig is marketing, right? So uh, conversational marketing. So I'm really excited about some of the projects that, uh, that I'm being presented with and opportunities to work with people doing really cool things. Um, but I, I kind of take it a step before that. So to try and take a, a 18 year old and just say, Hey, jump on this new trend. And they have to make that leap from I've never worked for myself or don't know any of the details or skills involved to, yeah, I'm going to jump into this new trend to just start a business. I, I kind of, I don't know. Do you agree that maybe get, helping them with maybe a, another skill within either your business or like this, the swimming instructor, um, some kind of skill to get their brain again, started to be trained in thinking this way. And then when that new trend is something that lights them up and they're excited about, then they'll be a little more prepared to oh, be de- able to handle the yeah. difficulties that that's going to present. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Yeah. Especially at a young age, they want to, you know, learn those, those different skills. You know, I just, you know, for me personally, I mean, I, I became an entrepreneur at, you know, I was about 33, I think, or so by the time I became an entrepreneur and I wish I'd started earlier. I had different things that got in the way. You know, I was working in politics. Then I go to law school, then I'm working, you know, for law firms. And then eventually I started my own business. In retrospect, you know, I wasn't raised, raised in an entrepreneurial family, so I didn't, I wasn't around it. So they weren't, you know, they were like, you know, go get a job, like at a restaurant, you're not going to like start a business. But these days, I mean, we're, you know, we're much more moving towards a more entrepreneurial society. So I'm definitely going to encourage my kids to do that. But yeah, I wouldn't encourage them to like, okay, hop into AI and, you know, or blockchain and unless they're brilliant, the next Elon Musk. You know, you probably want to learn some basics first, but I want to move quickly beyond that because I also made the mistake, you know, the first three years of entrepreneurship when I was running my own, you know, boutique practice, it was pretty much just me. Like I had some contractors, contract attorneys that I would do, do work with, but it was pretty much me making a job for myself. And I, I struggled with getting out of that so that I, wasn't the revenue earner because, you know, I had a couple of vacations during that time period where, you know, and I had, uh, we had a, a baby at the time when I remember going on vacation to the foothills, Sierra foothills, Arnold area. Um, so for those who aren't in California, it's like kind of central Eastern California and the Sierra Nevadas. And um, I remember a, a job opportunity, a client came thing came through and, you know, we were only there for like a week at a cabin and I, you know, I had to do it. I had to do it while my wife and my seven-year-old, seven-month-old uh, child went off on their own. She didn't want to be doing that, you know? Yeah. And I realized I got to change this. You know, I got to build more infrastructure, more of a company around me so that I'm not dependent on just me as the revenue earner. Um, and that was a hard lesson to learn. So I, I definitely want to teach my kids that lesson early on. Like, I would love it if they start, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's like, you know, a newspaper route or a lemonade stand, but hire your friend as soon as you can to work that lemonade stand so that you can hire another one and another one, another one. Um, I've got a friend here um, who, uh, whose kids go to go to school with my kid and is a phenomenal entrepreneur. His company just did a D series round at a multi-billion dollar valuation. And he, as a kid, used to do these entrepreneurial programs where 
uh, it, was, it was like a nonprofit that came in and got these kids and they would take them into different neighborhoods and they go door to door knocking on doors, which is such great preparation. I did it in politics, uh, but knocking on doors and selling like candy bars. They were like 11 years old, but really quickly they, they within this organization, they moved up the ladder and then they hired friends and they managed different teams to go out into these communities instead of them just being the ones knocking on doors. This is when they're like 13, 14, 15 years old. They're learning this lesson. Now they've got a multi-billion dollar company. So that's such an important lesson. I, and it's, it's a hard one. It, I would even argue harder than just like getting started in entrepreneurship, hanging your shingle and doing it all yourself. So I, would, I, I, will ho- I really want to hope to teach my kids that piece as well. Absolutely. I know that that's one of the first things that Evan did when he started his business is found someone who could help him with that. So it wasn't all just dependent on him. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. No, that's like, that's, I mean, that's the dream, you know, you continue to hire more people to take off some of those tasks because the whole point of being an entrepreneur is to be an entrepreneur. And if you're working in your business, not on your business, then you're just pretty much another employee. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And that, and I hear what you're saying, John, too, because um, what we want to do is take the mistakes we made or the things that we think we didn't necessarily do wrong, but that kind of held us back or made us slow down or didn't make us grow as fast as we might want and impart them on our kids, those lessons. Uh, And if we can, great, but, um, you know, we, we, we can't step over some of the lessons they have to learn, like the going door to door first themselves. I mean, no one can start with going door to door or starting with a team and them not doing it themselves so that they can't train right. their friends how to do it. Right. But it, I agree with you to speed up that process is vital. And, um, we all, we, we all want our kids to start ahead of us, right? We started here. Let's hope yeah. our kids can start 10 paces or a hundred paces ahead of where we started. That's I mean, like, that's such a hard challenge. I remember when I was, um, about 16 years old, My parents had given me a car. It was a rundown 1982 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme (laughs) T-top that for some reason, my parents thought it was a good idea to garage this baby for four years when from age 12 to 14, 12 to 16, uh, as if it was some pristine 1965 Mustang. I drove this thing for four months and got rear-ended, not my fault, got rear-ended and thing was totaled. And then I had I, I had thirty three thousand dollars in insurance money to go spend, and I went around and my best friend Jason, um, who I just saw last weekend, he was he he drove an old BMW because in his family for some reason old BMWs were their thing. Now BMWs from the seventies are crap; like they would they were expensive to fix, they would break down all the time. And I went around, I go around like going trying to find one for three thousand dollars. Like it's not that very much money to buy. And I remember my dad was so frustrated and he kept on like kind of butting heads with me on this, like, cause he could see I was making a mistake. And finally, one time I said to my dad, dad, let me make my own mistakes. And then he stopped. He was like, you realize he wasn't letting me make my own mistakes. Now I ended up coming to my senses, realizing $3,000 doesn't go that far. I ended up buying a Honda instead, a cord, which is much more dependable, much more reliable, still a piece of crap. But <laughs> anyways, I mean, the, the point is you got to you got to make sure that people learn their own their own lessons, their own mistakes, yeah. because otherwise they're they're not going to internalize it. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and if we can do anything, it's help them speed that up. Right. I mean, just like we do, if you're if you're coaching someone or consulting with someone, you're just trying to help them speed up that process of failure and success, failure and success by, uh, you know, by doing it faster by learning it faster, learning that lesson, but they still got to learn it. Yep. One place or the other. We're all human beings. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. I'm kind of curious about your views on, on something. So what, as your kids grow, and this is a little bit of a ways away, um, but what are your views on your kids uh, going to college? Is that something that you, will be a like a big is it like kind of a non-negotiable you have to go to college or is it more like you know go if you feel like you need to or what what are your, what are your opinions there yeah i mean you know it's very popular in the entrepreneurship community to be very anti-college these days and you know i've got i got great friendships out of college you know great experiences um now it can be very expensive too so i'm not sure i would recommend 
you know, throwing these days 200 grand after something, if you're not sure at all what you want to do, it might be better to take a gap year or go to community college. My wife works at a community college. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're, we're very much in favor of that. Um, but you, you know, there's also a great college experience. So I think with our kids, as they get older, it, it will, it will be figure out what they want. You know, I'm not opposed to them skipping college. Um, having said that, you know, statistically, if you look at statistics overall, um, if you, if you have a four-year degree, you're more likely to have a higher level of income. You, you know, you're more likely to own a home. You're more, all these different statistics are in your favor. Everyone can think of entrepreneurs that are the exception to the rule, but those are the statistics, you know? Uh, so I, I'll encourage my kids. I mean, I, I have a feeling they'll be shaped by, you know, their parents. I mean, my wife and I both have, you know, college degrees and advanced, you know, graduate degrees. Um, the graduate degree, I definitely wouldn't push them to. Um, I'm glad that I went and I got a law degree. A law degree helps you figure out how the world works. Um, but there are other ways to do that. There are a lot of expensive, less time consuming. So I probably would encourage them unless they're just completely wedded or unless they want to be something like a surgeon where they absolutely have to go to graduate school in order to be, you know, be that job. Um, I would encourage them to really think long and hard before they make that decision. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, my husband and I have this conversation all the time. Um, uh, and it's, we are on opposite sides of this, not opposite in the sense that we butt heads about it at all, but our conversation is always very much, very, it's a very, very productive conversation because we both also went to college, got bachelor's degrees and, um, he is working or actually he just retired from the field that he got his, his degree in and worked in for 30 years. He was a tax accountant. He had a business economics degree. And, um, and I didn't, I got my degree, you know, scientific degree from Berkeley, worked in it for a few years and then went, this sucks. And I went to did something else. And, uh, and so looking at the boys, you know, I'm like, I do what you want to do, do absolutely what you want to do. And he brings, he comes with, well, you know, gosh, what about, you know, the opportunities they have and are they going to have a harder time? I mean, we always worry that our kids are going to have it harder than we do. And in this day and age, unfortunately, it kind of seems like each generation, it is more difficult. I mean, to reach what we did in a bachelor's degree would really kind of require an advanced degree right now. But, um, but you know, it, it, I, I look at him and I say, do you really think that our kids are not going to be able to figure out how to buy a house? And of course the answer is, well, no, of course they're going to be able to figure that out. We're going to be here. They're going to be fine. We're going to educate them to be able to do that. Um, and uh, it, it's a tough one. It's a really hard one. I think you brought up a very important point, which is the cost of it. And if it's something like, well, Evan can share his experience with college because both boys actually got accepted to applied to and got accepted to colleges and started, but then left. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, I dropped out of college because I already had a business that was, you know, growing and successful. And uh, my logic at the time was why get a degree in something, you know, that that when you already have the thing, the degree is supposed to help you to achieve. Yeah. Uh, not that I would never go back, but I would only go back if there was a, a purpose to it, if I was going to use that degree for something or if I had a, if I wanted to get a job that required a degree. Um, but the fact that I have my own business means that it was unnecessary. So that was just time and money that yeah. could have gone towards the business to grow it. I mean, it's a great point. It's, it's difficult to figure out what the answer is to it. You know, the counterpoint, you know, would be like, I listen now to, you mentioned like someone who's got a, a CPA degree, you know, or finance degree or an MBA or something like that. You know, there's a, a guy named Michael Saylor is the CEO of MicroStrategy. It's a publicly traded company. He's a huge Bitcoin advocate and I was listening to a two hour interview with him the other day. And the guy understands the public markets. He does different means of finance, understands raising money, all this stuff inside and out. And I, I have a law degree, right? I could understand this stuff, but I didn't go and get a degree to understand it. So there's certain things that, as you know, you can start a business, but then getting a business to that upper level to the multiple seven figures, to the eight figures, to the nine figures. You know, in many cases, like having an advanced degree, whether it's a, a, an accounting degree, I mean, I, I don't have an accounting degree. I never took an accounting class. I was an English major, you know? So like, you know, those things would be um, in many ways, I, I'm jealous of people that have those types of degrees. Um, but, you know, if you're a lifelong learner, you like learning, you can teach yourself those things too, you know? I mean, 
I listen to podcasts all the time now. I'm mm-hmm. constantly learning. Um, there's YouTube. You can teach yourself, you know, virtually anything, anything. these days. Anything. You know, yeah. I agree. It's it's the mindset we have to work on way more than the tactics or the education or the knowledge. Well, and, and the, the knowledge, thing, yeah, we can the, find knowledge anywhere. Right. And and also talent, you can have talent anywhere, par- any part of the globe, right? If there's anything you can't do, yeah. you know, yeah. if your business is doing well, you can hire someone else to do it, whether yeah. it's doing your books, whether it's filing your taxes, you know, <clears throat> it's more about having the courage to do it, to, to attempt it and to talk to others and figure out from others how to go about it and what the risks are along the way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, you know, it agree. used to be you had to know these things. Yeah. And now there's there's you know, it's a global talent pool. And there's so many different platforms where you can hire people or get introduced to connect it to other people that can help you with their, these different pieces. So, you know, that's that's the other counterpoint to it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And there, you know, I'm I'm a part of an incubator, a local incubator. They're they're trying to bring uh funding, uh investment funding specifically to the Sacramento region. And um they I'm a I'm a mentor in this incubator with a pretty good fund behind it. And they're in their first cohort of uh, founders. And one of the founders has a great app that he's uh, doing with that has to do with sports and the scheduling of of fields and practices and all kinds of things. So he has an app uh, that he's building or a software that he's building for that. And we had a talk last night from uh, the founder of a program called Grin, a product called Grin, which is influencer marketing um, software that's just going gangbusters. I think they, they're they a billion dollar valuation. I think they're about th- two and a half years old. And wow. um, their last, they think they've got 175 million in funding or something their la- with their last uh, I think they're in series, uh, series B now. And, um, through that process, one of these founders is just like his head spinning, right? Series A, series B angel, you know, all these words and terms that are, you know, that are being tossed around and he's just, his head is spinning. He's like, how do I find out about this? And he's in an incubator. I'm like, dude, look around. (laughs) Everybody Mm -hmm. you're talking to has all the information you need. You're in this incubator. You've been accepted. So there are so many tools that we can find local, um, small business administration. That's how I started my first business. I went to the Mm. local small business administration that had free courses and free information for me to go sit in on classes. And this was, you know, pre-internet days, right? 2000, or at least the, the, um, the way it is structured now, no Google or anything. It was 2003. Um, it's everywhere. All you have to do is ask. And you're right. That's why I talk about mindset. You have to have that courage to actually ask and look for information and be humble enough to say, I don't know it all. And that's okay. There are other people who've been here and done this billions of people who've started businesses before us. I'm sure somebody's there that can figure it out for us. Yeah, exactly. And just, you know, getting them into communities to, you know, to get around other kids that are like-minded that they can, they can explore these things with and potentially have business partnerships with in the future. Yeah. You know, I teach my kids to, you know, if I'm in a, if I'm, if we're in a restaurant and one of my kids, even my five-year-old or something is like, uh, daddy, I need a fork. I'm like, go ask him over there, get up, go ask him. You know, I think that's really important, you know, to teach the kids to have the courage to speak up for themselves and go ask a stranger for something that they need. You know, I think that's an important lesson. Yeah. 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 Understanding though, I I think um, the only other thing I was at would add it, like you're saying with a CPA or anything like that, if you at least have a baseline understanding of all the parts of your business, it's going to be less likely that someone can take advantage of you. So, you know, uh, that's really important with how many people are online now saying they know their stuff. At least if you understand the basics of your bookkeeping, you, you will have less, you will be, uh, you know, less of a chance of having someone embezzle or take advantage of you or things like that. And that's a, that's a tough one. We all have to watch out for that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you definitely do. Um, and that's a trust, but verify, you know, type of thing, which I even continue to learn these lessons myself. You know, I mean, I, I've been fortunate. I haven't, you know, had a big embezzlement or anything like that. I worked at a company that did. Um, the law firm I was at shortly after I left, it turns out um, the woman who'd been the CFO was completely embezzling. But that was a case where embezzling from, you know, from the owners of the law firm. Um, that was a case where, you know, in retrospect, they were making some major, you know, lapses of judgment that they probably shouldn't have, like 
knowingly knowing that you know the CFO was signing their signature on checks like they trusted her implicitly on this stuff that they knew that it was okay that she would fake their signature you know so you can imagine what else they weren't doing they weren't checking the bank account it turns out one of the big lapses was um you know the the founder of this business the owner or the, the the lawyer um, didn't have online access to the banking records, so he couldn't double check them. And he kept getting the runaround from the CFO who said like, oh, it was blaming it on the bank. But she didn't want him to have access because she didn't want him to like look and see these extra charges that were coming through that she was paying to herself. Um, you know, and so like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a trust but verify, like you got to uh, be really careful yeah, you need to trust other people, but you also have to verify them. My business partner, Jeremy, does a really good job of this. You know, he's just a, a different strategies where we'll, you know, people that are doing work for us will kind of set, just do things to kind of indicate that we're watching things more closely, yeah. you know, especially setting the tone early. You know, when people start work, working for us, we'll say, we'll ask them some question about something they submitted to us to show that we're looking closely. Because everyone, you know, we've, you've, I've done work for other people where they don't question it. They don't question it. They don't question it. And eventually it kind of sends a message. Okay. They're not looking really closely at this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you have to browbeat them. It doesn't mean you have to mm -hmm. give them a hard time, but it does mean you should demonstrate you're, you're looking more closely. And it gives you opportunities to point out when things are great or train if things need to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's very interesting. So, as we uh, as we begin to wind down the podcast, we like to end on a bit of a doozy of a question. If you were to die tomorrow, what would be the entrepreneurial legacy that you would leave behind uh, for your kids to use as they, you know, potentially grow into entrepreneurs themselves? Hmm. Man, what a great question. Um, I think you know. I think it's a combination of just demonstrating to my kids persistence um, and trying things out until you figure them out, you know, because I've iterated my business in pretty major ways. You know, it's been 11, 12 years now since I've worked for myself and started, you know, practicing law for myself, solopreneur. Um, and, and, and that was after, you know, only having been out of law school for four years. And just deciding, even though it, all kinds of people have said, no, it's not a good idea. You shouldn't do it. Just deciding, okay, look, I can do this for myself. I, what I'm doing right now for this law firm, I can do for myself. And just bootstrapping it very carefully, keeping my costs down. Um, and then from there, figuring out that, okay, I don't want to do this for 30 years. I saw lawyers that did it for 30 years, and then they just turned off the lights. They had nothing to sell. And I thought that was tragic, you know, and so I decided, okay, I'm going to make this more, I'm going to evolve this to something that better fits my lifestyle. And I tried a lot of things that didn't work. I tried to, you know, innovate the business model uh, for the law firm before I went down other routes of starting a blog and a podcast, and then just finding the thing that worked for me, you know, and even then, you know, the business we have now, Rice 25, we didn't start, you know, by by building up a team and helping people with podcasts, we started doing events. But the, you know, the, also the commonality amongst all this stuff was we realized at our core, what we really like is helping other businesses and helping other individuals to learn to build better relationships. And whether it was doing it in an event, whether it was as a lawyer practicing law, helping people to navigate relationships, because that's usually the start of friction and litigation, or whether it's now helping to use a podcast that build great relationships with their clients and referral partners and strategic partners. You know, I hope my kids would look and see that I took those different steps rather than just sitting and just doing the same thing over and over again. I kept trying different things until I found something that was a better fit for our lifestyle and it really, frankly, a better business model. And now I love it. We have a great team. I love the work that we're doing. I really enjoy it. Um, and it's, it's been a lot more fun than practicing law. That's for sure. <laughs> I can imagine. I have some friends in law school and none of it sounds fun at all. No, tell them to quit now. <laughs> <laughs> Get out while you can. <laughs> I think, well, I don't think one of them is going to get out. That's for sure. His dad has a family law practice and I don't think he's getting out anytime soon. 
Mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a really tough profession because, you know, a lot of lawyers are really unhappy and a lot of them end up quitting the profession and just going to something completely different, which I guess that, I guess I count as that I'm doing something completely different. However, as an entrepreneur, a legal background is extremely helpful, extremely helpful, whether it's drafting contracts or navigating disputes or yeah. any of that, that kind of stuff. So I feel like the work that we do now, definitely my legal training is definitely helpful for it, even if it doesn't seem like that would be the case. Yeah. Well, right. even just the relationships and the comp- the communication ability that you have through that. Yeah. Wow. Well, John, thank you so much. I, I love guys. chatting with you. I'm so glad we were able to catch up again. I can't wait for the next conversation. Uh, you know, so many interesting people. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to tap you for a few more guests here. It sounds like you've already dropped sure. the names of a couple of people. Yeah. Uh, so we'll chat offline. But it's been a pleasure, and can't wait till we can see each other again and attend another conference. Uh, yes. Uh, or or meet in the Barlow in Sa- in Sebastopol. Who knows? Yes, that sounds great. <laughs> and for Thanks, people guys. who are for people who are interested in you and what you do, uh, where can they find out more about you? Sure. uh, Rise25.com is the website for our podcast services and then smartbusinessrevolution.com or on any whatever podcast player you you listen to is my podcast. So go check me out or on LinkedIn and uh, happy to connect with anyone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Parent Entrepreneur Power. Hopefully you came away with valuable tools you can use in your business, life, in relationship with your kids. If you want to hear more about our mission or if you want more insights into cultivating your parent entrepreneur power, join our movement to make entrepreneurship more accessible to parents and their kids at parententrepreneurpower.com.